Uh, well, good evening, everyone. It's a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know me, my name is Jack Lee, uh, the chair of the board for VINS. Uh, we're really excited to welcome everybody back uh, to the VINS campus. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time out of a beautiful fall weekend to be here with us uh, and spend some, spend some time with us tonight. Uh, I've been honored to serve on the board of VINS for seven years. Uh, to work alongside an amazing group of people uh, who serve on the board, both current and past members, uh, VINS leadership and staff, volunteers, donors, and supporters who are all here tonight. Uh, 50 years is an amazing milestone for any organization, let alone a nonprofit organization, uh, a tribute to the importance of the mission and to the vision of the founders and all those who have supported VINS uh, through its ups and downs along the way and there have been ups and downs along the way. Uh, I'm so proud to be associated with VENS. I know you all are as well, especially given that you're here tonight. Uh, and I'm looking forward to setting the organization up to execute on its mission for another 50 years and beyond. Uh, we're so happy that many of you could make this event uh, and of course are missing those who cannot. Uh, one former chair, Debbie Granquist, sent her regrets and some words about her experience that she asked us to share. Uh, so I'm going to read to, uh, to what she said. Uh, More than 30 years ago, I had the good fortune of finding Vins. Two incredibly passionate and devoted women, Sally Laughlin and Billy Ghosh, uh, came to my house to ask me to join the board. I knew very little about board work and even less about the environment and conservation. These strong women, together with Jennifer Lingelbach and June McKnight, taught me about this and more. As Vins was exploring, uh, exploding out of the old barn, we talked about a new nature center where we could fulfill our dreams. This brought David Laughlin to the table, one of the key drivers behind Vins, whose passion for the organization was definitely infectious. While I know that there are many names I do not have time to mention, I have to recognize Michael Weinberger, Anne and Peter Silverfarb, and the executive directors, Tim Traver and Sherman Kent, for their dedication to the future of this organization. I'm grateful for my time at VINS. I watched it grow from its youth into the effective, mature organization that it is today. I learned a lot, made great friends, and hopefully helped to make this world a better place. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you all tonight, recovering from a broken leg and hip replacement, but I am there in spirit. VINS and my friends will always be in my heart, which is probably sentiment that any one of us uh, feels uh, here tonight as well. Uh, many more of our Vins family are here in spirit as well, um, and uh, you know we wish they could be here tonight uh, in person. Uh, I'd like to introduce and turn things over to someone who needs no introduction to pretty much everybody in this room. Uh, Charlie Radigan, the executive director of Vins, has provided uh, vision and leadership to the organization and returned it to vibrancy and viability. During his tenure as executive director, Charlie has substantially grown every aspect of the organization, from programs to exhibits to education outreach to financial sustainability to an incre incredible group of leaders and staff who make this place an enjoyable learning experience for all who visit. Charlie will now help us reflect on the past and paint the picture for us uh, of what's to come for Vince. Thank you. Uh, could you all make sure you have a, a beverage to toast with? <laughs> Since I arrived, this uh, mic uh, stand has never worked. <laughs> we fixed many things at VINS, but this is not one of them. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. So I've been through this... Uh, talk a number of times in my head, um, but uh, it's just so wonderful to see you all. This was an extraordinary, beautiful day. The VINs had 611 visitors today, uh, but more important than that, we had an event this afternoon to celebrate our founders, uh, 
We have many reasons to celebrate, of course, uh, but what's better than celebrating 50 years and launching really the next 50 years? So let's have a toast to the last 50 years and a toast to the next 50 years. So is that just not the most wonderful sound? I'd like to acknowledge a number of people. Uh, first to the founders who are here, uh, Sally Laughlin. Sally, would you just raise your hand so people know where you are? And David Laughlin. And uh, Rick Farrar, who is home in Arkansas, Arkansas. And we'll get a copy of this evening's video, which, by the way, Teo Cigar is uh, doing the, uh, the video, and, uh, and Teo was the producer of the film, The Last Irene. So, Teo, thank you for being here. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> and also to June McKnight, who I think perhaps is here in spirit. And I'd like to personally thank Mary Davidson Graham. As you can see, um, Mary is really here, not in spirit, but really here. Uh, she has been such an important part of the success that uh, we're enjoying at the moment. And I'd like to thank the 50th uh, uh, anniversary committee. And in particular, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Susan Logan and Brucey well, for the beautiful table decorations, the flowers, etc. Thank you for your hard work. It looks wonderful. And I want to thank uh, Simon Carr. Uh, he's the former chair. He's not here this evening. And Ken Alton, who's a former vice chair, uh, unable to join us. But I was at Rotary in Woodstock, Vermont, in uh, March of uh, 2014. And Ken came up to me and he said, Charlie. You're a bird guy. <laughs> They're looking for somebody at Vins. So I said, hmm, that's interesting. So I reached out to Judy Callens, who was supposed to be here, but apparently is not. So I'm sorry about that. And I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Simon and uh, Tom Chiridelli. Tom, would you raise uh, your hand as well? <laughs> And I'm happy to say that they hired me, and what an extraordinary opportunity it has been uh, for me uh, to be able to join what is really a remarkable organization. Uh, there were going to be four former executive directors here, but Judy is not, so there are three former executive directors here. And I wonder if uh, Tim Traver, Sherman Kent, Sally Laughlin would stand up as well. And if you, could, if you could remain standing, that would be great. And also, there are a, a number of uh, former uh, trustees uh, that are here, and I wonder if they could stand as well. Peter and Ann, and, and yes. So please, uh, please remain standing, if you would, just for this uh, last bit of uh, memory. It's because of your for persistence and vision over the last 50 years through several uh, iterations, rising occasionally from the ashes of an adverse offense, VINS has become, thanks to you and your leadership, a world-class environmental education organization and a sought-after destination for residents and visitors to, the, to Vermont and the Upper Valley in particular. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Tom Chiridelli did not stand up, and he's a former trustee. So. Uh, and current board members, and I know there are a number here, so would you stand up as well, please?
So what a fabulous group of people who work diligently and hard as volunteers uh, to help us stay the course. Uh, we thank you for all you do. I'd like to have the staff stand up too, please. So nothing is possible without your creativity, knowledge, and hard work. And Vince prospers and works because of you and what you do. And I thank you. You may, uh, you may sit down. <laughs> so uh, I, I often talk to the staff about the gestalt, and not the mathematical gestalt, but the gestalt of art, and that the sum is greater uh, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's very, very true at Vins. We are much stronger together uh, as an entity than we would be if we were each separate. So the five or six businesses that Vins has prosper because they're all united and together. So thanks to the staff for doing that. I want to embarrass my wife, Beth, and, and thank her as well. <laughs> so Beth, could you stand up so people uh... <laughs> So who knew that uh, eight years ago when I said yes, uh, uh, honey, that uh, this opportunity, we'd still be in the game, essentially. Uh, and four grandchildren later, which is uh, really terrific. Uh, one of the hallmarks of our strategic plan written in, I know Jack said I was going to talk about the past and the future, so I'll try to do that for a minute. Uh, in our strategic plan, uh, which uh, we wrote in 2016 and became operable in 2017, uh, was goal number one, strengthen and support our mission by increasing the number of visitors to the Nature Center. We promised in that strategic plan that we would transform the Nature Center into a more compelling destination by fostering more engagement and experiences through new exhibits, on-campus programs, community science, and outreach. We have added new exhibits. Birds are dinosaurs, the forest exhibit, the bluebird enclosure, which is the former crow enclosure, but is now uh, full of uh, two of the most raucous and wonderful bluebirds. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. Along with the art sculptures, the bird muse uh, to house the growing population of education birds, the newly revented, that's renovated, Four Season Neo Pavilion, the lovely August Pavilion, and the newly opened Songbird Aviary are among the current Nature Center enhancements. But we want to mention also the restrooms, which we had been trying to build for, <laughs> for a long time and that are now operational uh, up at the Nature Center, and the beautiful newly installed split rail fencing that outlined the meadow and the entrance of the Nature Center. I think you'll agree if you drove down the driveway and saw that, that it was just an extraordinarily beautiful addition to what used to be ropes. So thank you for, for that facilities guys, Chris Collier and others. And of course, we want to mention the Forest Canopy Walk and that most remarkable of experiences. And uh, I, I'm just delighted every time I walk on it, and every time I take somebody on it, the experiences that they have and what they say is just so gratifying. So what has all this meant uh, to VINS? What has been the result? Well, the numbers sort of tell the story. Last year, VINS welcomed 69,811 visitors uh, to the Nature Center. In our community outreach, in spite of COVID and other restrictions, we reached another 13,000 people. So that's a pretty big impact. Uh, we seem to be on pace uh, this year to reach 72,000 plus. So that is also very, very exciting. Now to put this in perspective, the total visitors in 2015 was a little over 24,000. So a dramatic, dramatic increase. So thank you for 
everyone and thank you for the support. Uh, it's just been terrific. Um, so over the... <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, VINS has been engaged this year because it's time for a new strategic plan uh, on both the staff and board levels in crafting its next five-year strategic plan. The centerpiece of the plan is our vision of a world where there is a deeper understanding of nature and where VINS fosters a love of the natural world and encouraging children and adults to become stewards of the environment. Our four strategic goals are first, enhance and diversify our program offerings. Second, work to reach a greater number of people. Third, have a greater impact. And fourth, secure VIN's financial future. And we have strategies to accomplish these goals. And of course, we will need your help to do so. Over the last number of years, VIN's has been able to build its endowment and endowment related funds in part because of legacy giving on the part of a number of VINS friends who remembered VINS as part of their estate. Legacy giving and building the VINS endowment helps secure the future so that VINS continues to accomplish its mission. Thank you all for your friendship, support, and consideration. I personally am so appreciative of what you have done and what you do. All right, that's enough of me. <laughs> now, now let me introduce my friend, Meg. Lowman, Lowman, where is she? Where are you? Where are you, Meg? Ah, oh, there you are. Yes. So Meg is a scientist, author, and all-around inspiration on so many levels. Meg, known as Canopy Meg, by the way, is a global pioneer in forest canopy ecology. She's a tireless educator, strong advocate for girls, women, and minorities in science. She describes her passion for trees this way. What causes me to leap out of bed each morning is the opportunity to explore, research, and conserve global forests. Mentor the next generation, especially women and minorities, in sustainability and forest stewardship, and educate diverse audiences through advising and storytelling, and she's a great storyteller, by the way. So ladies and gentlemen, Margaret Meg Long. Oh, thank you, thank you honey. <laughs> thank you so much, what an honor. And tonight I would love, love to give you a little context for how important what you have done here is for the whole planet. I don't know if everybody appreciates that, but maybe you will after this talk. First of all, please raise your hand if you ever climbed a tree in your youth. Oh my gosh, isn't that great? Now, be honest, raise your hand if you've ever been on this canopy walkway. Oh my goodness, A plus, Charlie, you've done good. <laughs> that is fantastic. And um, you know, it's something about maybe our ancestry or whatever, but having access to trees, which birds love, and you all have this mission of birds, and now the treetops is so fantastic. And I think it's just great to be here as part of this amazing opportunity to speak to you. And just very modestly, you know, Charlie came to me because I taught ornithology with an app. This was his pre-Vins days. And I was one of the first professors that used an app because my students loved it. They hated a textbook, right? They loved the app. And he came down to Florida and I said, hey, while you're here, why don't you come out and see my walkway at, in Florida, which was in the state park called Mayaka River State Park. And he must have pocketed that little idea because he called me two years later. Guess what? I think we need one in Vermont. <laughs> so I brought you Robbie Oates and all those great guys, and they did a great job. And now we're heading to Madagascar to do the same thing. So that's where I'm going to put this in context for you a little bit. Um, but I just want to say, as one of the first arbornauts in the world, do you know what an arbornaut is? Be honest. Oh. Maybe you all do. You're so smart. Um, you know, astronauts study outer space, aquanauts go undersea, arbornauts study the top of the trees. So 
Un unfortunately for my mother, I was one of the world's first arbor nuts. So, but this is where I grew up. Like you, it was upstate New York where the trees turn color, and it's so fabulous. I was never here at this time of year before, and it looks so, so beautiful. But three quarters of the world does this, right? Around the equator, the leaves are green all year round. So we are in the minority for leaves and foliage, and most of the world is doing this. And so it's amazing to think about all these treetops. And for 200 years, foresters studied trees from guess what? The bottom. They looked at the tree trunk. They usually only saw the top when they cut it down. So we missed 95% of the subject material until we started thinking about what was going on in that 95% of the tree up at the top. So it's pretty amazing. I did this in 1978. I'm so embarrassed, but I'll show you these pictures anyway. I made a slingshot out of a piece of metal that I welded in the shop at the University of Sydney, Australia, and I sewed a harness from some seatbelt webbing, and I climbed up a tree, and lo and behold, guess what? Nine, you know, 50% of the world's species were up there. I didn't know the number at the time, but I just was surrounded by this. It would be like coming from Elmira, New York, where I was born, and going to Times Square on New Year's Eve, and you're like, oh my gosh, I never knew so many people lived in the world. So the canopy is this unexplored place that no one ever knew about. And now we use these harnesses and ropes and slingshots Here's my student Anthony, 330 feet high in a redwood tree, discovering that fog goes straight into the leaves. It doesn't go to the roots and come all the way up the tree. And all these amazing things that we never knew about until the last 20 or 30 years, because God bless the world of forestry, of which I am part. Um, we never really studied the top of a tree until recently. And now we can climb these trees. This is in Taiwan, and students are doing this amazing research to figure out what lives up there and how in the heck does it keep our planet healthy. So lo and behold, as I climb these trees with my slingshot and my rope and my harness for about 10 years in Australia, I suddenly realized, guess what? A, there's people who can't climb. B, what if you need 20 people at once to count all the bugs? or do something really cool like stay up there all night. So over, uh, I hate to say it, a really great bottle of Australian red wine, an ecotourist lodge owner and I designed this thing, what if we did a trail in the treetops? So this was the world's first canopy walkway in 1985, and um, it's in Queensland, Australia. Has anyone ever been there? Oh my gosh, look at you guys, that's fantastic. And it's still there, and guess what, Charlie? The boards are still strong. So rest assured, your um, you know maintenance programs will be just fine. And so this started the launch of these amazing places where people could work at once, or folks in like my mom in a walker, or a lady with a stroller, or someone in a wheelchair can also get to the canopy if it's designed properly. Um, so I came back from Australia. The first canopy walkway in North America was built by me at Williams College, where I was a professor, just down the road, but it's very modest. It's only in-house. It's nothing like what you have, so only students can go there. And in the case of Williams, alumni who will write big checks get put up there, and then they can't come down until they write the check. At least that's what I've been told. So. It's not so much used for research as it is for development, so that's kind of interesting. Um, and so then I moved to Florida, and the first public canopy walkway in the U.S. was built in Mayaka River State Park in, outside of Sarasota, Florida, which is the model that Charlie used to come here. And the same team that built that also built the one up here. So this one now has a half a million visitors a year and generates $30 million dollars for Sarasota County, meaning hotels, restaurants. And that resonated with me as I go to countries like Madagascar and Mozambique and Ethiopia, and guess what, they have no money, they're cutting their trees down and selling the logs for $5 a tree, and it's just so, so sad. So suddenly I think to myself, what if we could do better than that? Um, but first of all, to round out the toolkit, 
for an arbor knot. We have the ropes and harnesses. We now have the walkways. In some places, we have these construction crates. But Charlie, I don't recommend it. You don't need one here. They cost about a million dollars, and they only take researchers up for very short visits. Um, and we also have inflatables. I do recommend that. I think a hot air balloon in Vermont could be very cool, don't you? But we use these occasionally to do blitzes on forests around the world. And I only show that so you get a sense of how new and how innovative the toolkit is. This is of thousands of the budget of NASA. This is nothing compared to how much money we invest in research in other places. But yet forests keep us alive. So the whole planet basically underfunds forests, and yet we really need them. And VIDS is part of a network now that's going to really bring forest education to the forefront, I think, of many, many visitors. Um, what did we find when we climbed these trees? As I mentioned, half of the species on the planet live in the tops of trees. You have so many new species in your trees. The minute we could get a little bit of internship with UVM or maybe Dartmouth or some of the other nearby universities, you will be amazed at what's up there. It's so incredible, yet very little has been researched or discovered because forestry had a long history of looking at the bottom of the tree and not at the top of the tree. So all of a sudden, now we realize, thanks to arbor knots and canopy research and walkways like yours, that forests are worth millions of dollars. They store carbon. They house the world's genetic library for the future, which has medicines, fruits, flowers, all kinds of important things. They control climate. Have you ever noticed here that it's a little cooler under the tree than it is out in the middle of the highway? You know, it's amazing how trees are an incredible climate control, and they also control rainfall patterns. They keep water from rushing downstream to the oceans with their root systems. And for about two billion people in the world, maybe more, they are also a spiritual heritage. Has anyone ever gone to the forest and you feel good? You feel healthy, you feel cleansed? Yeah, it's like, hello, it's, and there's, I saw a book in a, a local bookstore saying forest bathing, which is a whole other topic. But you know, there's a really wonderful spiritual element of going to forests. And when I work in India or Indonesia or parts of Asia, everybody needs a fig tree or a spiritual tree for their religious sanctuary, which is amazing. Um, we also know kids need trees. They're absolutely, I think, linked to nature and it makes them healthier. There's been all kinds of data showing that kids do better in school and they're, they sleep better at night and all sorts of things when they get contact with nature, which is really, really wonderful. Um, this little group here, um, our third graders in our canopy walkway down in Florida, I'm gonna challenge you for this, but they actually drew pictures Every year, the teacher brought them from the third grade at a local school, and they drew pictures. And one year, they saw all the leaves getting eaten by an insect. And so we found out they discovered a whole new species of weevil eating the bromeliads in the tree. And they got published in the scientific literature. So you don't need a PhD to be a scientist. You just need to be a kid with some kind of power of observation. So I'm sure your school kids here will do the same kind of things. Um, we also have places where, unfortunately, forests have disappeared. And this is a Google Earth image of Ethiopia, where less than 3% of the forests live. And can you see barely these, oops, sorry, um, these little tiny green dots, I'm trying to get my, there it is. That's the remaining forest in a world of subsistence agriculture. So this is what I'm gonna to bring to bear to you tonight. We have a blessed, wonderful sense of forests in North America, but in many countries of the world, people don't have Google Earth images, they don't have computers, they don't know that the next valley has been logged. And this is the case in Ethiopia where the church forests, as they're called, are the only remaining patch of green. And this is the church, and the priest believes he is the absolute steward of all of God's creatures. 
And I, as a conservation biologist, know that I am also a steward of biodiversity. So by some amazing, fortuitous accident, I got partnered with the Coptic priests in Ethiopia about 15 years ago. And today we are trying very hard to save these last genetic libraries in this country, which will benefit greatly from a canopy walkway, which could provide income and stewardship to these people. But right for now, because the farmers plow, they don't know that it's a danger thing to do. The cattle come in and eat all the seedlings. They don't realize those are the last seedlings of these species in the whole country. And of course, all the birds and all the animals and all the insects need to live there, but they are very, very threatened because these little patches are shrinking. So what we're doing in Ethiopia is partnering with the priests, building beautiful stone walls around these church forests, as we call them, funding them, which is very, very inexpensive. For a half a million dollars, we're funding 40 forests to be retained. But these are part of the global issues of how important forest canopies are to keep every country and every child and every global component healthy. And in the case of Ethiopia, it's very typical of many, many countries outside of the US where unfortunately people haven't been given biology classes in high school and the kids don't have books to look at biodiversity and understand the importance of saving their trees. So I'm gonna share with you how this walkway is part of a new network where we are very excited about turning that trajectory around and making sure kids around the world, not just in Vermont or Florida where I live, can have an opportunity for a healthy future. And we all know the challenge. Global deforestation is pretty huge and pretty threatening, but we have the solution right here at VINS, right down in Florida and other places. So I started a little project last year. I'm going to go to the grave with this project. I will hope that by the time the earthworms are digging away at my little body and decomposing me, that I will be able to save 10 of the world's most endangered forests by using the VINS model in a few other places. And this model of Mission Green is 10 by 10 by 10 by 10 to the second, we call it, to build 10 canopy walkways times 10 of the world's most endangered forests that have the highest biodiversity that cost $10 million, a million dollars each, and we'll hire 10 to the second women and families in all of these settings to be the ecotourism stewards and make a sustainable income from their canopy walkways. So it's really exciting. Disney's excited, National Geographic's excited. You are part of the map of making sure that this program actually works. Um, a friend of mine who is a marine oceanographer named Sylvia Earle started a program 12 years ago called Mission Blue, where she brings attention to the highest biodiversity endangered pieces of ocean, like coral reef areas and some of the places where mangroves are being developed. And she doesn't have an economic component to her model, but she brings a really good attention to the globe about saving these important places. Um, and then secondly, another mentor for me has been in this project, a famous biologist at Harvard who unfortunately passed away in January, but Ed Wilson was part of my, he was the chair of my board for Mission Green, and he advocated that we could use canopy walkways as this amazing economic model to help all of these different countries save their genetic libraries by preserving the most important forest canopies. And so here are the 10 places. Um, yeah, I have to say, Vermont is not on the list, but the good news is Vermont's way out front because you already built your walkway. And um, we hope that we can help the countries that can't afford to help themselves. And right now we're fundraising to build a walkway in Madagascar, which I'll show in a minute and we're moving on to build a few others in other forests that are the recognized biological highest diversity forests on the planet. 
that also have the greatest threat of disappearing because the people can't afford to do what we all can afford to do here in North America. So now we have a new walkway just built in Peru. We're hoping to fund marketing for it, which is fantastic. That obviously is a forest that we all need to save for our own children and grandchildren. We have another successful program that we just finished last year in Malaysia, another extraordinary rainforest that needs saving for all our children and grandchildren. And we have a new walkway that just succeeded yours. It opened last August in the Redwoods in California, which is fantastic. Another really important forest to save. And of course, we are hoping and praying that we can next year take your team, the same guys, Robbie Oates and the rest, to Madagascar and build a walkway there where 97% of the forests have been logged. 3% is left, but all the lemurs live there. Hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of species live there that live nowhere else. And we're really excited about giving that gift to that community so they can hire the local women and families to run this operation and save the force of Ethiopia through the Canopy Walkway ecotourism model of Mission Green. So here we are. I got this picture from Charlie. I've never been here in fall foliage, but you all really put this mission green on the map because you did it yourselves. Thank you very much. I want to clap for you. You fundraised for it. You built it. Um, you opened it up to the public. It's a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. Probably in Madagascar, they need a little of our help. They need the best signage. We might tap the people that built your signs. They need the best guide training. Maybe we'll talk to you about what you do to your education staff to get them so inspired and motivated. They need to think about those important concepts that you all share in your walkway with the rest of your visitors. So all of these things come together under this program we call Mission Green. Maybe they need a spider web. It's my favorite thing in the world. And, you know, every kid I notice loves that, but so do adults, right? So lots of opportunity here. So hopefully by 2030, we hope that this project called Mission Green, of which you are a founding part, will help save the best force in the world that will have this amazing necklace of canopy walkways around the world with a passport that Disney will sponsor someday that will share the opportunity for families not to travel to the Eiffel Tower, no offense, or the Louvre, but to travel to the canopy walkways of the world and see biodiversity and breathe fresh air and feel a part of saving all the trees on the planet. Um, so with that, um, I wrote a book about it. You can read it. I think it's at your bookstore. But I would like to call Charlie up for the last part of my talk and make a very small presentation in honor of your new canopy walkway. Mr. Director. <laughs> this, this microphone's kind of wild. I have to hold on to it. Sort of like a spider. Um, Anyway, I, in honor of your walkway, Mission Green, this new program that is now building walkways to save the forests of the world, wants to present the first platinum plaque to the Vince Walkway for bringing kids and families together to appreciate trees and to be part of the family of global canopies and help the future generations have a healthy planet. So thank you. So uh, we're so honored to have Meg here uh, today. Thank you so much for very inspiring talk as I always have. Thank you, Meg. Thank you.